This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being, being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. The Invitation It doesn't interest me what you do for a living. I want to know what you ache for and if you dare to dream of meeting your heart's longing. It doesn't interest me how old you are. I want to know if you will risk looking like a fool for love, for your dreams, for the adventure of being alive. It doesn't interest me what planets are squaring your moon. I want to know if you have touched the center of your own sorrow, if you have been opened by life's betrayals or have become shriveled and closed from fear of further pain. I want to know if you can sit with pain, mine or your own, without moving to hide it or fade it or fix it. I want to know if you can be with joy, mine or your own, If you can dance with wildness and let the ecstasy fill you to the tips of your fingers and toes without cautioning us to be careful, to be realistic, to remember the limitations of being human. It doesn't interest me if the story you are telling me is true. I want to know if you can disappoint another to be true to yourself if you can bear the accusation of betrayal and not betray your own soul, if you can be faithless and therefore trustworthy. I want to know if you can see beauty even when it's not pretty every day and if you can source your own life from its presence. I want to know if you can live with failure, yours and mine, and still stand on the edge of the lake and shout to the silver of the full moon, Yes! It doesn't interest me to know where you live or how much money you have. I want to know if you can get up after a night of grief and despair, weary and bruised to the bone, and do what needs to be done to feed the children. It doesn't interest me who you know or how you came to be here. I want to know if you will stand in the center of the fire with me and not shrink back. It doesn't interest me where or what or with whom you have studied. I want to know what sustains you from the inside when all else falls away. I want to know if you can be alone with yourself and if you truly like the company you keep in the empty moments. By Oriah from her book, The Invitation. Valeria interviews Lisa McCourt, the author of Juicy Joy, Seven Simple Steps to Your Glorious Gutsy Self. Lisa McCourt has taught a consciousness-raising tool called Clarity Presence for over two decades to thousands of seekers across the country. Incorporating the techniques she's learned from studying with and writing for many of the biggest names in the transformation world, her group and private sessions provide the most effective, streamlined processes available for accessing and maintaining consistent, authentic joy and inner peace. Process is backed by hundreds of scientific studies demonstrating substantial increases in health, cognitive function, self-esteem, stress reduction, and emotional competence. Lisa founded The Love Shack, a live event community of seekers and sharers of love-based wisdom, and she is also a best-selling author and ghostwriter specializing in the field of personal transformation. Her joyful passion for the power of words has propelled a diverse publishing career studded with industry awards, starred reviews, international honors, and mega sales. 
On the secret side of Lisa's publishing path, she's been the silent ghostwriter for many prominent thought leaders, from New York Times best-selling authors to Emmy and Golden Globe-nominated Hollywood stars. Protected by ironclad confidentiality, her clients have appeared on Oprah, Good Morning America, Saturday Night Live, The Dr. Oz Show, ABC's 2020, The View, The Today Show, Dr. Phil, The Doctors, and The Nancy Grace Show, as well as on stages all over the world. Lisa has also penned over 40 books in her own name, including I Love You, Stinky Face, the long-standing bestseller that Publishers Weekly called a modern classic. Together, her books have sold over 8 million copies. For over two decades, Lisa has shared her clarity presence technique on stages around the world. A former popular CBS radio host and a frequent speaker at both writing conferences and self-growth events, she brings her passion and unique blend of skill sets to an eclectic career path that is ever mysteriously unfolding, just the way she likes it. Her website is lisamccourt.com. Here is the interview with Lisa McCourt. In your own words, who is Lisa McCourt? Oh my goodness, so many things. I think that Lisa McCourt is a journeyer for sure. I have been on quite a journey and who Lisa McCourt is has been a lot of different things at different points in my life. And I guess um, being a seeker, that is how it is for all of us, probably you as well, Valeria, that when we, we put so much uh, value on learning and growing, it's hard to, um, you know, kind of define who we are at any particular time. But I definitely am a self-dev junkie, someone who is just excited always about learning the next thing and the next thing, especially as it applies to this issue of living a joyful, peaceful, free life. Sounds really wonderful to me. Before we talk about clarity presence and some of the topics in your book, Juicy Joy, Seven Simple Steps to Your Glorious Gutsy Self, I have a few warm-up questions, as I mentioned, off record. So the first one, I often ask this question, but not to every guest at this time. I'll ask you, what is life to you, Lisa? What is life to me? Yeah. I think it's an opportunity. It's so much more malleable than we originally believe it to be because life is perception. And whatever our experience of life has been up to this point has dependent has been dependent upon this very narrow little tiny window of perception that has been our experience here in this, this human body. And to me, life expands exponentially when we learn that that little perception is the minuscule sliver that it has been. And we can open that up and really turn life into anything we want it to be. Since you mentioned the word perception, that's an interesting word. Can you tell me what that is and if perception is connected to beliefs and ideas, concepts? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in the, the work that I do with clients that I call Clarity Presence, it's really all about understanding um, our perceptions, that our perceptions are just thoughts and thoughts are not bad, but they're just not as substantial as we think they are. All of our thoughts, all of our memories exist over in our egoic mind, which is different from our big self. Our big soul self is not where our thoughts and our, our perceptions and our opinions reside. They always reside over in this egoic mind that we use to create the persona that we send out into the world. And all of those thoughts, if, if there's any situation or person that you're having a thought about, 
I, I do this thing where I, I hold up my hand. You can't see me, but I'm holding up like a fist and saying, you know, imagine that it's a statue. And then your whole truth about this thing is from your limited little perception from where you're standing in relationship to the statue. But if you could walk around it a quarter of the way, you'd see it completely differently. And if you walked around it to the back, you'd see a completely different statue, which is just, you know, an entry point for talking about duality and non-duality. So really our perceptions are creating our whole experience of life, but they're not really all that real and substantial. They're, they're things that we can get in there and wiggle around with once we start learning how to become the observer of our thoughts. Mm, right. I have a lot more questions for you on that <laughs> later on. I'm going to continue for now with the warm-up questions. The follow-up okay. question to that one, what is life, is what is the opposite of life? Is there an opposite to life? Is there an opposite to life? I think that's like a two-part question. If we're defining life as our perception of life so far, then yeah, the opposite could be any of our beliefs or limitations that we've accumulated. You know, men are this, women are this, life is this, the world is this. All of those have an opposite that we can embrace if we're calling that life. Mm. But I think the bigger understanding of life is the life force that runs through us, which is our soul self, our big spirit self. And I don't know that that has any opposite because that's just the oneness that, that we all share. That's the everything, the whole, the source. If, if that's going to be our definition of life, then then I feel like it's it's complete in itself. Yeah. The first part is easy to see, right? Everything has an opposite. But then the second, most people miss out, unfortunately. But not for long, we hope. My next question is about freedom. What is to be free? What does freedom mean to you, Lisa? Again, I'm going to have to put it through the filter of the, you know, the work that I'm so absorbed in. Freedom is freedom from your egoic mind, freedom from this persona that the world knows you as, you know, this is our, our body and our job and our political affiliation and our clubs that we belong to. All of that is the persona that we project to the world. And that's where all of the limitations arise. That's where all the, the suffering comes from. I don't think we would want to be completely free of it all the time and just live over in that other soul part of us because we're here for, for human adventure. I love the whole earthly package. I love the pleasures of the flesh and that, that little bit of drama, you know, not too much, but that little bit, that kind of makes life interesting. But I think freedom is having the skills to check out of that egoic mind when it serves us to, uh, to be able to observe it from our, our bigger self. Oh, I love your answers. <laughs> At this time, what do you think is the world's greatest need? And do you have a vision for a new reality? Mm, yeah, this is probably a duh answer, but love is what the world needs. And coincidentally, handily, love is what we all are made of. We just don't always know how to access that part of us. We're all just these love-powered glow sticks walking around in these meat suits, but we have all this accumulation of thoughts and beliefs and things that we feel are important that are, you know, often fear-based and anxiety-based. And I think that um, what the world needs is for there to be more widespread understanding of how to transcend that part of ourselves so that we can be more aligned with our, our big self, which every single person has, because it comes standard with the package of this human experience. We just don't all have the same access to it. So I think that's my vision for the new world would be just for more people to gain access to the part of them that is love and compassion and, and wisdom. Right. Yeah. I'm wondering why so many of us don't have access to that big self. And is there a reason for that? And my second question is, is there a time it might be that most people are not ready to access that part? 
of themselves? To my way of looking at it, I feel like humanity has been moving in a good direction all along to to more and more access of it. I I think that we're all here individually to go on that journey as well as collectively to go on that journey. And your first question, you know, why is that I think it's just not what's really taught or emphasized in our culture. I think that in some cultures it is more readily available, but especially in our, our Western culture, the things that the children are taught to to prize and value and where they get their sense of self-worth is all from that egoic mind structure. It's all about you know, you know power and material things and and the, the egoic mind because it's all based in thought is very flimsy because because thought isn't really anything right it's just these little little energy constructs so because it's so flimsy there's something inherent in the egoic mind that always feels threatened that always feels like it has to shore itself up and make sure that it's and you know it creating this individualistic expression and is going to fall on the spectrum somewhere between better than this person and worse than this person. And that's all just egoic mind stuff. But we're so trained to pay attention to that from the earliest experiences that wherever we give our attention and focus to is what grows in our life. And, and it grows to the point that it obscures our connection with our, our source energy, I feel. Yeah. Typically. What is your understanding and idea of peace, Lisa? I think, again, there's the the personal answer and the collective answer, and they're probably not so different just to microcosm or macrocosm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think it's first and foremost an understanding of oneness, that that we are all part of the same energy field and causing deliberate harm to any facet of that energy field is is causing harm to the whole. And I think when we get clear on that in our own minds, it affects everyone around us and that starts to affect the collective. Yeah, I I think that the peace is full surrender and acceptance of what is, not because we're not going to change it, because only from a place, I think, of full surrender and acceptance can we come from the right energy to effectively make changes. But yeah, I think it's, it's stepping out of those egoic mind spirals. <laughs> yeah, it goes back to that, right? So in a way, you're speaking of inner peace. Let me ask you a question about God or the idea of God. So do you ever use the word God? I do. I'm very comfortable with the word. When I work with clients, I kind of get a sense of whether or not they're comfortable with that word. I don't think it's the only word that fits, but a lot of people will have associations from a religion they grew up with that that might taint the word in the way that I would want to use it. So if I get a sense that that's going on, I might say source energy or or just uh, divine wisdom. But I love the word God for myself. I talk to God. Yeah. I like that too. So the reason for some people to reject the word God, would you say it's connected to religious beliefs? I don't even know what to say because I try not to uh, take sides, but does it have anything to do with religion, organized religion being harmful to humanity? I feel that that's where a lot of people would first have been exposed to the word God. So they are exposed to it through the filter of their organized religion. And my own personal belief is that, yeah, organized religions, while well-intentioned, do more harm than good because anything that says my way is the only way um, is totally tied into egoic mind thinking. So I, in, in my mind, yes, the, the wars that have been waged over organized religion and just the exclusivity of it to me, is not really conducive to the kind of divine oneness that I would want my clients to experience. But if a client is having a you know wonderful relationship within their religion, then I would work within that framework with them. Yeah. Do you see a difference between spirituality and religion? I do. I, I just because of the um, openness that that spirituality, the way I've experienced it, and the way that I would certainly you know hope to pass it on to others is very all-encompassing. 
and to, to my mind, organized religions, that would be the, the main difference is that they aren't all encompassing. Yeah. And my final question, what do you think is the purpose or the main purpose of your life at this time? Oh, it's such a sweet question. I've always just really had this almost sophomoric view of myself as wanting to put more love in the world somehow. And I do that with my own stuff to an extent, but I also have always in one way or another done what you're doing here and tried to share the word of what I call just love-based wisdom keepers. I have a platform right now, but I do every Wednesday, I, I send out a Zoom link to people who register for this love-based wisdom keeper regular series that I do called Love Shack Dish. And before that, when the world was open to live events, I would have live events every month where I would have people that I had written for or worked with in the past because I've been in this industry for ever for 30 years and I write for a lot of authors and um, gurus and therapists so I just want to spread any message that I feel helps elevate the level of love in the world and I don't know why but I've just always been that way so I'm going to go with that as what I feel my purpose to be. I love that. I don't know why, but <laughs> that's beautiful you to hear. You right? It seems like it. Look at you. <laughs> yes, right. Absolutely. Yes. I can relate to that very, very much. And I don't know why. It feels right yeah, in every way. How did you become a writer, Lisa? You know, they, there's stories about like basketball players who say, you know, we have to put in the, I don't know how many hours or some number of hours out there that they say you can become a superstar at anything if you log the hours. And I think that's how it happened. Growing up, I was just an avid, avid journaler. That was my therapy. I had some challenges in my childhood situation, as we all do. And for me, that was my outlet, my my place where I could go to get sane, where I could find some peace within myself was writing in journals. And I've saved them all. And if I stack them one on top of another, they're taller than I am because that was just the, the way I went through childhood. And in school, I wasn't really great at a lot of things, but I always excelled at my papers and my, you know, my writing classes. So I kind of knew when it was time for college, well, it's going to have to be, you know, publishing or journalism because <laughs> right. right. I was good at so I, I just went into publishing from there. And once you're in that world and you start meeting people, it just becomes a little bit of a easier path. There's something about writing. I always talk about this. It's, um, it's so healing, magical, I feel. Yeah. What does it mean when we are having clarity? What's the meaning of that? And also, what is to be present? Okay. Um, clarity presence, I coined the term, but it's based really heavily in Eckhart Tolle's work. As we were talking about, I've been a seeker my whole life and Eckhart was the, the most profound, um, transformation that I ever went through. It was before Oprah had discovered him, I had discovered him and the, the, I had taken some trainings on how to teach his work. So I had you know done kind of a deep dive with it and there's, a million valuable, wonderful points that can be made from that body of work. But the one that really just kind of hooked into me that I became obsessed with is this idea that we've been talking about already, where there are these two parts of us. There is my persona and my egoic mind, and there is this other part of me. And I guess I knew that or wouldn't have argued that point prior to delving into Eckhart's work. But it was the first time in my life that I really felt it and, and felt the ability to shift into that other part. And it changed everything for me. That was just my big wow, my big aha. I continue to be a self-dev junkie and work with countless other gurus. And I would go on all the retreats and get the certifications. But I realized after 20 years that nothing ever was as profound as that one piece. And that all along, well, no matter who I'd been studying with, what I would always glom onto and make paramount in my investigation of their work is how do we do that? What are the different ways that we can move out of egoic mind and into the big self? 
when we want to, when we need to. And I've realized working with clients that not everyone has the same access points. For some people, you know, one thing doesn't work at all. And for others, they need some sort of energetic clearing. And some people don't want to work with energy and you just have to, you know, talk to them and use just thought therapy or some other technique. So clarity presence, I, I name Eckhart just use, uses the word presence. He says, you know, when you're when you're present is when you're moving from unconsciousness to consciousness when you're present. But for me, the experience of embodying presence is clarity. It's like all of a sudden everything else falls away and you can see so clearly what is before you to do or how to make this decision or what your next steps are. It's just that blissful clarity that comes from being in presence. So that, that's why I call it that. And it's been a component of my work with clients for, you know, the whole time that I've ever done any sort of coaching, but it's only recently that I've decided to just pull it out and make it the whole focus because everything else that I've ever taught or done just pales by comparison. So, so that's why I've, I've made it just the central point of what I do right now. What comes to mind for me is not having self-doubt. Is that possible not to doubt? That is beautiful. Yes. I'm, I'm so glad you put it that way because I, I think that's what it is, is that all of our lack of clarity is really so saturated in the presentation of our persona to the world. So when you're able to observe that, because when you're observing it, you're not in it. So that means you're identified over in your big self and, and just sort of laugh at how much weightiness we put on how we look and how crazy that is because nobody's looked at us. Everybody's <laughs> worried about how they look and right. and you just sort of, everything becomes silly when you can look mm-hmm. at it from that piece of like such That's so fun. true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's the human predicament in a way, is the human drama, the experience itself. It seems like we need to experience both in a way, being silly, being driven by the ego mind and, you know, making these uh, what we call mistakes, which I don't see anything as a mistake. I like the idea of laughing at ourselves, like, yeah, I'm silly for trying to look good for others. In the sense, there's um, some compassion. I'm like, yeah, it's okay too, you know, to, um, to try to please others. It's not hurting me. That's a really good point. Yes, absolutely. And I think that when our mind isn't clear, when we have all this cloudiness, it's because we're mired in thought and there's a, a tendency or, or one way to look at the, you know, getting out of the egoic mind is going into no thought. And there are masters who can achieve no thought for a decent amount of time. Not very many. Mm-hmm. I can't. Mm-hmm. But to me, it's about, yes, when you're observing the egoic mind and sort of playing with it, that is thought, but it's a higher dimension of thought. And the quality of thought feels different from that perspective. And from there, we can see the difference between I want to do this because of compassion, because I feel that this is the right you know, step to take as opposed to you know, other reasons for possibly wanting to do things or do you also connect clarity, presence to surrender, acceptance, letting go? Absolutely. And that can be tricky because, you know, for a lot of people, surrender feels really scary. And even acceptance, it's like there are things that, you know, we don't want to accept. In the world right now, there are some things happening that, you know, surrender and acceptance don't feel compatible. It feels like we need to take action. But I I do still maintain that it's only through surrendering to the fact that this is this is what's happening right now. However, it got to be this way, whatever it is, this is what's happening, because through full acceptance of it, we can get to that higher quality of thought and see what are the most effective steps to transcend it, to create positive change and positive forward movement for humanity. This movement from the egoic mind to the the higher self, or the way you say, the big self, is that a process? Does it take an experience, a radical extreme experience for some of us? 
or for some people just happen naturally and they are able to transition in? From my experience, I feel that it does happen naturally sometimes, but usually when that's the case, it's through some severe suffering, some some traumatic experience can can force somebody into needing to find another way to 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 deal and to to look at the world. I'm sure there are some people who just have kind of these epiphanies without having to get there, but um, I, I think that's more rare than than would be nice. But the other way to do it is through, you know, just really genuinely wanting it and studying with someone to achieve it. You know, so that's why I feel like the more people there are out there, that's why I do what I do with the Love Shack. It's like, you know, everyone's going to vibrate a little differently and resonate to someone else's voice. But the more we have on this team of helping people to raise their level of consciousness, the more people are going to be reached because we don't all resonate with the same teacher. So I think that more often than not, it happens when someone just decides they want it and they want it and they want to go, you know, study with someone and learn it, but it can happen spontaneously and, and usually through trauma, I think. Can we use the ego mind to serve the soul, to serve the big self? That's where it, its place should be. Absolutely. When, when we have the, the tools to tap into the big self, you know, the, the big self can then move around those, those flimsy little thought forms and organize them in such a way that the egoic mind is in service of the, the greater self. Yes. Wow. You talk about authenticity and self-love. This is where the journey begins. So this is an interesting topic. Is that a, one of the methods, becoming more authentic? That word has been kind of been out there. Everybody talks about being authentic. So I want to understand, like within your work, how do we know when we are there, when we are really being authentic? That's a great question, because I, I think that that word is interpreted in a lot of different ways. Um, you know, I, 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 for some reason, my mind goes to teenagers. I've done some work with teenagers and sometimes they think, well, if I dye my hair blue yeah, and yes. my nose and do this, then, then I'm expressing my authentic self. <laughs> but, you know, usually, I'm not going to say usually, but uh, it, it's, it's easy to fall into the trap of wanting to make yourself stand out from the crowd and differentiate yourself. But all that truly is, uh, persona that that's all egoic mind thinking when when you're focused on separation from others when you're focused on individuation that's really not your authentic self because your authentic is your your big soul self which is exactly like everybody else's big right. soul <laughs> true Most pure loving part of you that's connected to source energy so it's it's kind of a um kind of a tricky thing talking about authenticity to me the more authentic you are, the more you can be light and, um, and, and, and not very invested in the persona. So in a way, it's not connected to the way we look, but more the way we navigate life and uh, thoughts and understanding. How did you know in your case when you're there, when you had, let's say, achieved clarity presence? I, I think that, um, you know, to tie it in a little bit with your, your question about authenticity, that yes, it's not what we look like, but it also isn't really even our opinions. Mm, <laughs> because, right. <laughs> true. Oh, yeah. It's like anything that, that, that sets us up in opposition to others, you know, like I believe this and, you know, and I feel that's so ignited in our world, you know, with the, with all the, the COVID stuff and people, you know, they, everybody wants to, to have a position, you know, should the world reopen? Should the world not reopen? You know, is the government doing a great job? Is the government doing a crappy job? Everybody is so aligned with positions and that's just all ego, all persona. I think the most authentic position is to be in in not knowing to to understand that all positions have some some 
relative validity and we don't have to be so serious about who I am and what I stand for. I mean, just in the last few years, the political polarization is such a flare up of ego that to me, authenticity is kind of letting go of all that and just finding connection with that piece that's really just like everybody else's piece. <laughs> I'm wondering what it looks like in a social environment. Like, how do you communicate with family members and people who are still friends, people around you who are still, let's say, living that kind of life, the dualistic one and the opposition, the opposites? What's the conversation about even? <laughs> Can you have that kind of a conversation with somebody? <laughs> I, I probably would just not have the conversation. <laughs> I think you position yourself with compassion. And the more that you can align with your big self, the more you can see it and everyone else. And you know that if they're not expressing it in that moment, it's just because they don't know how to access it. And they're just their their view of, of that piece of them is obscured at the moment. And unless you have compassion for others, and I certainly wouldn't argue with anybody and say, get out of your egoic mind if they didn't know what I was talking about. But with my clients, I will, you know, because they know what I'm saying. But um you know, it, it's more common than not to be fully identified with your, your persona and your ego. That's the, you know, the majority of the people that we encounter. So there's a way I feel to just kind of walk around with the intention of helping them find the presence within them. You know, people laugh at me. I smile and say hi to everybody I pass in post office to the grocery store to wherever you know, we're going out these days because that does allow somebody for a moment to make that connection with you. If you just look in people's eyes and, and they can feel your presence, that's, you know, that's what Eckhart Tolle says in the whole time that I was learning how to teach his work. He barely taught us how to teach anything. He taught us be in your presence and that will I'll give others the entry point to theirs that, you know, just being in that calming energy will allow them to find the way to their their place where they can match you. I love the poem that's an opening for the step the one invitation. emotion. Oh, the invitation, right. So I'd love for you to read it. Is that possible, Lisa? Okay. It doesn't interest me what you do for a living. I want to know what you ache for and if you dare to dream of meeting your heart's longing. It doesn't interest me how old you are. I want to know if you will risk looking like a fool for love, for your dreams, for the adventure of being alive. It doesn't interest me what planets are squaring your moon. I want to know if you have touched the center of your own sorrow, if you have been opened by life's betrayals or have become shriveled and closed from fear of further pain. I want to know if you can sit with pain, mine or your own, without moving to hide it or fade it, or fix it. I want to know if you can be with joy, mine or your own, if you can dance with wildness and let the ecstasy fill you to the tips of your fingers and toes without cautioning us to be careful, to be realistic, to remember the limitations of being human. It doesn't interest me if the story you are telling me is true. I want to know if you can disappoint another to be true to yourself if you can bear the accusation of betrayal and not betray your own soul, if you can be faithless and therefore trustworthy. I want to know if you can see beauty even when it's not pretty every day, and if you can source your own life from its presence. I want to know if you can live with failure, yours and mine, and still stand on the edge of the lake and shout to the silver of the full moon, yes. It doesn't interest me to know where you live or how much money you have. I want to know if you can get up after a night of grief and despair, weary and bruised to the bone, and do what needs to be done to feed the children. It doesn't interest me who you know or how you came to be here. I want to know if you will stand in the center of the fire with me and not shrink back. It doesn't interest me where or what or with whom you have studied. I want to know what sustains you from the inside when all else falls away. I want to know if you can be alone with yourself and if you truly like the company you keep in the empty moments. Oh. <laughs> oh. 
This is amazing. Yeah, this is amazing. I will make copies. I never heard of this before. How come? <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> this is truly wonderful. It really is. It's all just captured right there so artfully. Beautiful. Um, would you like to add anything before I ask you my final questions? I, I think the one thing that we didn't talk about that is, uh, to me, such an important part of Clarity Presence, and after every question I thought, oh, I should have said that, <laughs> is the part about the presence, the present mm. moment, because mm. that is really what is one of the main tools that we have in seeing how flimsy and silly all these thoughts that we carry around are, is that all we have is this present moment. The past doesn't exist. The future doesn't exist. And people can buy into the premise that the future doesn't exist because we know no matter how much we plan or try to manipulate the future, just a little thing like 2020 is enough to show us that we have no control over the future. The future doesn't exist until we create it. And sometimes it's a little bit of a harder sell to say that the past doesn't exist because we feel like we have all this evidence that the past exists. But when you deeply understand that all of our memories are just thought forms and all of those thought forms are just those perceptions we talked about, this tiny sliver of perception of this thing, you, you see that it really is all so ephemeral and malleable that even the past, the only reason the past stays alive for us is we feed it our attention and our energy. If we stopped feeding it, eventually it would cease to exist. It wouldn't immediately because we've been giving it our attention and energy so long because our egoic mind needs it to create our persona. So we've been giving it our attention and energy. So it would subsist for a while on that. Eckhart uses a, um, analogy of a wheel, that if we, we spin a wheel, then that force that we put into it is going to make the, the wheel spin for a while. But if we don't go back and spin it again, eventually it'll run out of spin and it'll yeah. stop. And yeah. it's the same thing with the past. You know, so many people say, oh, but I had this trauma and I have to go back and address it and I have to do this and this. Not really, because it's all just memories. And once we can get so clear in our minds that all these memories and thoughts are nothing, then we we can make the most of this present moment, which is where we're creating every next moment and the next moment and the next moment. And it's the energy that we're embodying right now that's so important in that creation process. And when when clients get really clear on that, it's just so imperative to feel good and to do the things to take care of yourself and have compassion and love for yourself that it shifts everything. I think I interviewed somebody who talked to me about something that I never heard before. She actually transitioned. She passed this year and then I interviewed somebody who was her, her um, manager or CEO. And her idea was that we are basically addicted to thoughts. That's mm -hmm. an addiction. Would you use the same word, an obsession with ideas and concepts? Absolutely. That's what identification with the egoic mind is, is when you don't know how flimsy and unreal your thoughts are. When you think that every thought that pops in your mind is something that you should believe. Mm -hmm, yeah. That's when you're addicted to your thoughts because we're all going to have crazy thoughts. I have weird ass thoughts all the time, but I know not to attach to them or right. believe them because they're not true from the perspective of my higher self. They're only true, you know, in the egoic mind. So addiction is a good word for it. Yeah. I think that's rampant addiction to thoughts. Kind of resonated when, when he said that too. To be present, it takes self-awareness. So the more aware we are, the more present we become. That makes sense to the idea. I know Eckhart Tolle, he talks a lot about awareness too. And we didn't talk about methods. Do you assign methods, specific methods like meditation, journaling, I do. I have what I call my, my bucket of tools mm -hmm. that yeah. early in feeling into a client, we, we suss out, you know, what's going to be most effective. And sometimes it's some trial and error and we try different things. But I do recognize that everybody's 
energy and, and where they are in their you know journey and consciousness is going to require different kinds of angles to hit it from. Yeah. 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 I love meditation. I love journaling. I use a lot of, I use EFT tapping. I've done a lot of different energy uh, modalities with clients that seem effective. Such a wonderful work. Thank you so much for what you do, Lisa, which is basically easing or trying to reduce suffering, unnecessary suffering. Well, thank you so much for what you do, spreading all this love in the world. You're beautiful. (laughs) Thank you. So I have a few more questions. Let me see which ones I'm going to ask you. I have so many here. Uh, Yeah. Do you believe in unconditional self-love? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) it's easy to believe in that right this idea of unconditional self-love and that's what's really required of us and when we when we get that then we have it for everyone because we are all the same self so absolutely yeah how do you define success what is to be successful to you to me, to be successful is to be happy in this earth experience. I think we're here for joy. We're programmed for joy. And the most direct route to that is is love, love of self, love of others, love of whatever is happening, being able to be light with our, our challenges and our, our experiences, knowing that they're all here for a purpose. Edgar Tolle has a, a quote that, um, that I use a lot. It, it's life will give you whatever experience is most helpful for the evolution of your consciousness. How do you know this is the experience you need? Because this is the experience you are having. <laughs> so, it's like, mm, Right. <laughs> if he says it and he believes it, I can accept that. And I've had some crazy experiences in 2020. Let me tell you, it has not been an easy year for my family because mastering this stuff doesn't mean we're never going to have challenges again. It just means that we're going to receive them with the grace and ease to move through them as expediently as possible. That's to me. I love the idea of trusting them, like trusting the experience. What was the hardest lesson to learn about yourself in life as of today, Lisa? Well, I mean, not to be a broken record, but I, I go back to, you know, I, I realized when I did that training with Eckhart that I was 100% fully, fully identified with my egoic mind. And, and you know, that was a hard realization. And I think it, it is kind of daunting when people first make that realization. And, you know, just that I'm so grateful to have had the tools to, to work on that since that point. But yeah, I was very, very fearful and, and anxious for a lot of my, my younger life. That realization that I was, it, it almost feels like a, a selfishness, like, like, like being self-absorbed now when I look back on the way I used to to think about the world and, and the way I would uh, barricade myself, you know, emotionally from, from experiences. Do you think most of us are kind of afraid of going through this transition, like, from ego to be more identified with the big self because we don't know what to do then without the personality. We're afraid that we will lose the personality and therefore lose our relationships with other people, which might happen, right? That's a great question. And I hadn't really thought of it that way before, but that's a really, you know, that's a valid point. When we change, the people around us change, you know, to my experience, usually for the better, but certainly, and I see this in couples a lot, unfortunately, where one of them is is really on a path to grow and change and expand. And unless they're somewhat on that path together, they're, they're going to end up separating because the vibration, the energetic vibration that brought them together isn't going to be a match anymore. You know, when one of them raises their vibration and the other one doesn't, and it doesn't have to be completely neck and neck. You can do like a little spurt and a little spurt and they catch up. But uh, that is part of the reason that we see, you know, so many couples not, not doing that thing that we used to think couples had to do, which is (laughs) make it forever and ever and ever, because there's so much vibrational shift on the planet right now and so many people are growing at different rates from those around them so it's valid that somebody could have a fear from that absolutely that's why it's very important to uh understand the surrender part of it because it is part of the experience isn't it ultimately it is in the end letting go of the body as we lose it 
Yeah, I kind of like this idea of letting go little by little, dying before we die. Yeah, that talks about that. Absolutely. And just even meditating on the, the morbidity of forms, knowing that this person that we have so much resentment and anger toward, whether it was a parent or an ex-spouse or whatever, you know, in a hundred years, we're both going to have shed earthly frame with all the thoughts that we have and all those resentments. And we're just going to be those two love forms and we're going to have no beef with each other. So, yeah, that is one of the examples that he uses is to meditate on morbidity. If you knew you would die soon, would you make any change in your life or do anything differently? That's a great question. I don't think so. I think I'm so dedicated at this point in my life to expressing (laughs) unbridled love to everyone who I love, which is a lot of people and drives my kids crazy. They'll they'll tell you. I don't think so. I'm, I'm doing what I love. I might, you know, kick off work a little bit more and, and not focus on the the more you know career centered aspects of things but but I love what I do so mm, I love that answer <laughs> <laughs> the wisdom behind that answer <laughs> what are three things about life you know for sure my mind goes to that quote that the only thing that certain is change <laughs> mm-hmm, yeah something along the lines of the evolution of my soul of our collective soul I'm not saying it as artfully as I would have liked, but I think I know for sure that that there's movement in the universe. And I feel certain that it's movement in a positive direction and that, that humankind is moving toward a higher level of consciousness and evolution of consciousness that'll change everything on this planet. I have a certainty about that, change everything for the better. A second thing I know for sure Mm, I'm, I'm I'm getting something that that feels uh, feels a little braggy to say, but I'm just trying to let let source tell me what to answer. But I think it's it's not braggy if I I want to include you and and tons of other people in this. Is that my purpose here is to contribute to that in some small way. My purpose here is to, in whatever way presents itself for me in the next moment, in the next moment, to do my small part in accelerating that evolution of consciousness and and you're you're doing it too and a lot of people are doing it and, and probably we're all doing it in some way but absolutely yeah everyone's doing that in their own ways yeah for sure <laughs> being the student or the teacher <laughs> um i think you said Lisa, one more thing to add i'm just gonna i'm just gonna go with the the oneness the mm-hmm. other thing that i know for sure is that we all are the same energetic field we all are one is the whole namaste uh, package that, uh, you know, we all have that, that big self in us and it's just there to, to be revealed. Thank you so much for your presence, your timeless wisdom, as I call it. I have a part in the, my website called Timeless Wisdom. I have one more technical question. Where can we find more information about you, your books, work, products, services, and future projects? Thank you. It's at my website, which is my name. It's Lisa, L-I-S-A, McCourt, M-C-C-O-U-R-T dot com. That's where the Love Shack Dish lineup is, where I I interview people every Wednesday at noon Eastern. And um, I'm doing a, a consciousness raising program with a coach friend of mine that we repeat periodically, Rob Mack. He's an amazing, amazing coach. So uh, that might be on the site, depending on when people go to to see it. It's a eight week intense uh, small group experience with only eight people. So depending on when your listeners are at the site, they might see that offered as well. And I do Clarity Presence private sessions via Zoom which are, um, you know, hour long. I, I sell bulk packages of those. I have them actually reduced to half price for COVID times because so many people are having financial hardship and I just wanted to do my part to make it as affordable as possible for people. So I, I train people in Clarity Presence one-on-one. Wonderful. Thank you again, Lisa, and we'll talk soon. Valeria, you are so, so, I love your energy. It's been such a pleasure to spend this time with you. Just thank you for being you and doing what you do. Yeah, thank you too. Bye for now, Lisa. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening. To learn more about Lisa McCourt, please visit her website, lisamccourt.com.
To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. I want to thank the Patreon members, Lawrence McGrath, Mark Basden, Terry Clayton, and Aidan Bickrock. Thank you again for listening, and bye for now. Thank you.